my dream is to we can develop some uh, like international network or regional cooperation in a such a way that uh, the development activities of one countries uh, do not ha uh, have negative impact on uh, natural resources and uh, water sectors in other countries, other neighboring countries. And I hope that in the future with the Orange Knowledge Platform, we can move from these communities centered around single training courses or single organizations to a larger community of pract practitioners where uh, people from all over the world who share problems can uh, connect and, and also discuss solutions with each other. And in this case, we can help not only the person, but also the community the government, the stability in the region, we can we can bring peace, we can bring a good economy, we can bring good health, we can bring better jobs, we can fight poverty. What I'm dreaming for my country is to see not only this specific institution where this project have been in the other, I want to see in the country Leaders at all level are being real, real to this gender mainstreaming activity, real to be gender equality activity, making themselves more committed and making themselves be responsible to address gender equality issue. Because what I see still in most of the places are things are a bit more tokenism. Que les lycées arrivent à répondre réellement aux besoins en termes d'emploi ou en termes de, de, de the prise en charge des, des apprenants, des étudiants. That's huge ambition, but if we can contribute a very small part in that, as well for the young people, as well for the private sector itself, yeah, I'm really happy. Hello, good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, we uh, welcome you to the Orange Knowledge Programme Impact Day. And on behalf of uh, NUFIC and all the organizing uh, um, partners, uh, we would like to welcome you. Our theme today is Share Challenges and Opportunities, Present and Future. I'm honored to be your host today. Uh, my name is Mariah Balt. Uh, from the Netherlands, I'm a member of the Orange Knowledge Program Advisory Board and passionate about education. It's wonderful to see already in the chat how many continents are represented uh, in the audience today and uh, all the many languages that we have. We have, of course, today English as a language. Um, uh, but uh, there's many ways to interact with one another uh, later in the program. So before we start with the program, we would like to explain you a couple of uh, house rules, which of course you have already received uh, through mail. Um, if you're planning to uh, share confidential notes, then be aware there's a recording of this session. Please turn off your camera if uh, you're not comfortable with that. And uh, please stay on if your connection is lagging, but turn off your video as well. We encourage you very much to uh, interact with us also through Twitter and other social media. Here you see our hashtag. And so uh, this is uh, very much encouraged also to share with us in the chat. So uh, the program today, uh, we started um, you know, in the morning here, but we are quite well aware that in the US it's still night and in Asia uh, we're very you know, uh, much ahead uh, in the day. So, um, we are going to start uh, with a couple of uh, keynotes, and I'm very proud to say that we have some great women uh, presenting uh, them their ideas in the keynotes um, today. Uh, we had a, quite some sessions uh, in, uh, in the past two weeks, which we're going to share with you about, and, and many of you have already attended, so that should be exciting. That's the looking back part, and then we're going to have in the later um, later in the in the morning uh, the looking forward program with also an impact 
award ceremony, which should be exciting. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce you our very first keynote speaker. And I'm excited to um, announce that that is Pascale Grotenhuis, who is a director of social development, ambassador for women's rights and gender equality. Um, uh, she's a very experienced diplomat and I already saw in the chat that we have some people from Mozambique. Well, there you go. Pascale used to be ambassador in Mozambique. Uh, so that is, uh, is already quite some connections here. Pascale, I would like to uh, pass the floor to you and welcome. Well, thank you, Mariah, uh, for your kind introduction. And um, it, actually, I saw some of the contacts in Mozambique as well. So, bon dia. Um, I still miss Mozambique almost every day. Uh, I was the ambassador there from 2015 until 2018, and I've seen firsthand how the Orange Knowledge Program can transform lives. Um, maybe just sidetracking a little bit of my, of my keynote, we established an Orange Corners uh, for young entrepreneurs in Mozambique together with the private sector, with the Dutch private sector, but also with the Mozambican private sector. And we were very happy with the Orange Knowledge Program in Mozambique. Um, because it gave us the opportunity to invite the Erasmus University to work together with the Mozambican universities to put entrepreneurship into the curriculum. Uh, and we've seen so many beautiful stories of both professors, teachers, but also students that really feel empowered uh, with the new skills they received um, to make an impact to their life. And I think that's, uh, that's the central theme for today. So I'm very happy with all the international attendants. I, I saw quite a few in the chat, uh, and it's my pleasure to uh, be giving you the keynote speech today. So good morning. Going back to the speech now. So the development landscape, as you all are very well aware, has changed over the years, and new challenges are emerging. People having to deal with conflict and violence. I just spoke this morning with my colleagues in Yemen and Ethiopia about their work in these challenging circumstances. Human rights and the space for civil society are increasingly under pressure. The COVID pandemic is exposing and exploiting inequalities of all kinds, including gender equality. And the kinds of effects of climate change are so clearly showing. As you all know, the Netherlands strongly believes that peace and sustainable development are interrelated. Without peace, there can be no sustainable development. And without sustainable development, there will be no peace. That's the reason that the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, are the cornerstone of the Dutch policy in foreign trade and international development cooperation. International cooperation, and I've spent most of my years at the ministry within international corporations, means working with different partners from different backgrounds, people with an open mind, willing to share knowledge and to ready to invest in the future. It needs people like you, academics and participants in training and higher education. They have a special and autonomous role to play, addressing important issues such as food security, water, climate change, sexual and reproductive health and rights, and security and the rule of law. And I would add climate change. Education is instrumental in working towards sustainable economic and social development for all. It provides a great platform for bringing different cultures together, sharing knowledge and learn from each other, and very important, fuel innovation. The Netherlands has a long tradition in investing in training and capacity building for young professionals from developing countries. I think uh, one of the key networks that all the ambassadors are very lucky to have when they go to uh, their posting is the alumni network. People who have studied in the Netherlands know the Netherlands um, and know Mozambique in my case. It was very useful to have that group of ambassadors of Mozambique to the Netherlands and ambassadors of the Netherlands in Mozambique. Training and capacity building are instrumental in closing the so-called skills gap that hampers sustainable economic and social development. And the Orange Knowledge Program builds on this long tradition, linking it to the Dutch priority areas, such as food security, sexual rights and health rights, sexual and reproductive health rights, 
on gender equality. Higher education in particular has a distinctive position in leading the implementation of many international agreed goals, such as the SDGs, and to create a sustainable future to, through teaching, research, and dissemination. Higher education institutions stimulate innovation, critical thinking, and the development of a range of skills, attitudes, and values amongst the students, who will eventually hold key positions in society not only in government, but also in the private sector and other important areas. It promotes dialogues and spaces for collaboration within and across borders and fosters mutual understanding and sharing of knowledge and experiences. Again, with the Orange Corners program we had in Mozambique, we linked it with the colleagues in South Africa, with the colleagues in Sudan, with the colleagues in Angola. So we are also looking at cross uh, borders cooperation. Training and research programs, as well as scholarships, allow the Netherlands to contribute to building a better and safer world and to create stability and sustainable development and growth. Creating chances and perspective for young people that enable them to develop themselves in their own community is a key priority for the Netherlands. That's why we have an ambassador for youth, employment and work. It will allow them to take part in decision-making processes within their own community. Students, academics, participants in training and higher education have a crucial and autonomous role to play in reaching the SDGs. Learning about the world and learning from each other is key. It brings me to COVID-19 and digitalization. Um, and I think I joined one of the, um, the online webinars on this topic together with Mariah, actually, uh, I think in my first week in the job. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed and enhanced inequalities. It has further brought to light the vulnerabilities of the world and increased gaps between countries, between communities and between boys and girls. We have witnessed a disproportional effect on women, girls and minority group, vulnerable groups due to a lack of social safety nets, discrimination and stigmatization. At the same time, COVID-19 has shown us the crucial necessity of resilient and adaptive systems and societies and the willingness to help each other and to come together in a joint response of global issues. We've seen protests, we've seen youth movements, we've seen people sticking together and making noise, even in very difficult circumstances. The Corona crisis has made also visible how dependent we are on digital technologies. With digital technology, technology events like this, like today's Partner Day, could not have taken place and we could have not communicated and shared information with each other. Technology allows us to adapt to the situation we are in and enables us to continue our lives in a different way, but making use of alternative ways and means. From purchasing food and non-food items to receiving healthcare, individual tests, healthcare advice online and even online schooling. But however exciting the promises and some of the actual showcases, digitalization does not automatically translate into prosperity for all. Some of the developments in digitalization are a case of serious concern. And we must be aware that about half of the world's population still has no access to the internet. The digital divides that exist across demographics and abilities, including gender and differently abled individuals are extremely worrisome. Unfortunately, not everyone benefits equally from the technologies. And I would like to stress the disadvantaged position of women and girls once more in this regard. They have less access and less opportunities to acquire digital skills. And as quite a few news articles and research has shown, girls are the first to be um, taken out of school to help the household. So it, it, the, COVID, the COVID pandemic increases the pressure on young girls to leave school. Women and girls that do have access suddenly find themselves having to deal with online sexual harassment, discrimination and violations of their privacy. So we also need to be very aware of that. I believe, and I know you believe as well, that women and girls are powerful agents of change. And if we want to take the 2030 agenda seriously and really meet the SDGs, we must continue to invest in women and girls by ensuring that they can go back to a safe learning environment, be it online or in an offline classroom session. 
Capacity development programs like the Orange Knowledge Program are crucial in times of COVID. They provide individuals with the necessary means and tools for developing skills, their ticket to the future. Institutional capacity development programs offer a platform for solid curricula and development, addressing issues that are important to all of us. Partnerships between universities are instrumental in providing a safe learning environment for capacity development in our partner countries, with a special focus on the Horn of Africa, the Sahel region, and the Middle East and Northern Africa region. There's an absolute need to further improve the impact of capacity building in order to contribute to better prospects, especially for young people and women. Which is why we need to continue investing in regional cooperation and the exchange of knowledge institutions and to promote North-South-South cooperation. It will improve the quality of education and increase the range of programs and instruments on offer in our partner countries. We believe that the knowledge institutions in our partner countries could be better equipped to sustainable contribute to the country's knowledge and capacity needs. It's crucial to link them to existing interventions, both at the front and during the implementation. So I would like to end this keynote to ask you to make a strong case to join forces, to work together to enlarge the impact of the Orange Notice program. Not only through providing the synergy between the instruments of the program, but also through a addressing issues as gender equality and real inclusion. Digitalization can help us to shift the power imbalances and put people in the driver's seat, if done right. It allows people from any community, gender or geography to meet their own needs and aspirations and to make an impact to their sustainable future. I wish you a really fruitful and successful day. I hope you will learn from each other's stories and I look forward to our cooperation. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Pascale, for this uh, wonderful keynote. And there's uh, so many uh, issues that you highlighted that are relevant uh, for the audience, I suppose. Of course, uh, the bigger picture that we're all working towards the sustainable development goals, uh, you know, towards uh, 2030. Um, and, uh, you know, how education uh, plays this very uh, crucial role in this. And indeed, as you already highlighted, the, the, the way we're sitting here today and the reason why we can still come together, together in spite of the corona crisis uh, is because of uh, digitalization. And we're uh, well aware that uh, some people really want to be here but don't don't have the proper access or it's too expensive uh, to uh, to join and in that sense still uh, about uh, half of the world population is not properly uh, connected to the internet so um, uh, what i wanted to uh, to ask you is the following uh, you um, uh, you have highlighted also uh, the, the elements of innovation and creativity. So many uh, people uh, that don't have the proper ad access do so in blended ways, for example, um, uh, through uh, low tech means or offline, they still uh, get involved. And that is something which um, uh, your uh, ministry is also uh, working towards. And I wanted to know, um, in light of the uh, knowledge uh, collaboration uh, that many of the institutions represented here are, are working on and individuals, um, these uh, challenges that you mentioned how can we, uh, together with the ministry, work towards overcoming those challenges together? What does it take? And how can we really uh, get our input into building on the opportunities of uh, digitalization and, uh, and knowledge collaboration and education? Well, thank you very much, Maria. Um, that is a really big question. Um, I think that this whole COVID pandemic has shown us two sides. One is, one is a quite optimistic side, 
Um, I mean, in Africa, uh, what I saw in Mozambique is that many young people um, have access to mobile phones and it's easy to organize your finances, their mobile solutions. Um, and what I find really, really strong is that what I saw in Mozambique is that it's very important to keep the messaging simple. And if you use the mobile devices, uh, the attention span of everybody is much, much shorter. So you need strong messages and strong uh, pictures or photos to tell the story. So I think that's something that um, really gives me optimism. Also uh, something that we can use actually in the Netherlands to keep it simple and to use the, the, the space that we have, which is very different than what we used to have. What I find very difficult is, is to see the inequalities um, between boys and girls, between generations, between people who have access to the internet, access to the grid, access to electricity, people um, who have come um, out of jobs because the economy is, is being hard, uh, being hit hard. So it's, um, it's well, I think it, it just um, exposes all the developments that were going on anyway. You can see uh, the impact of climate change immediately um, um, being, being a burden on top of the consequences of the COVID pandemic. So what you say about the blended uh, solution, I think that goes very well also for, um, for the education sector. So on the one hand, make use of all the, the, the steps that have been taken. I think uh, working from home has finally uh, getting a true sense for everybody with all the complications. I have two young children who run around, not now, but when school was closed, uh, they were of course in my home as well. And my husband also works from home. So sometimes the Wi-Fi, even in the Netherlands just explodes. Um, so use the technology that you have, use the, the mobile phones, but also look um, to contribute to existing initiatives. So if, if for instance, the banks in, uh, in, in Africa are quite good with the mobile banking, see if you can tag along also in maybe informing about financial education or other, other important issues. Um, and I think training staff in partner countries is a really big challenge. I think all of us who are in the call now have had to adapt um, to the new circumstances. But also, of course, people in, in teaching professions, in university and knowledge institutions, everybody was used to an offline um, education. So it's, it's, we, we need to help ourselves as well and to help our colleagues as well how to adapt to these new situations and to find benefits, but also be careful because I think remote uh, teaching, you cannot see really how things are with the students. Um, I think it goes with all of us. It's, it's quite difficult to read the emotions and expressions and, and how they are uh, from the screens. So a blended one is probably the best we can have in circ circumstances we are. Um, but please look after your staff and your pupils as well, because it's tough on everybody. Yes, indeed, here, here, because uh, this is something that we're dealing with uh, in all uh, our, our practice. I, I also experienced that yesterday with my students who are tuning in from all over uh, the world. And you don't know how they're doing. You can't really tell. Um, just um, do you have a, a final message uh, for um, this uh, partner day? and how we, um, uh, can you help us um, uh, look forward a bit uh, together with your ambitions as an ambassador for women's rights and gender equality? Well, thank you very much, Maria, and also for the opportunity to, uh, to address all of you today. Um, I uh, was in Mozambique really impressed with the Orange Knowledge Program, and it's a huge program, it's a huge network. Um, I would love to urge you, to stimulate you, to raise awareness, to find each other, to um, use each other's experiences and also keep innovating. Because the, the one thing that the COVID crisis has shown all of us is that if we don't keep up and if we don't innovate, we will lose it. Um, 
so make use of the huge network uh, you you are and you have and the, the ties with the Dutch government, but also with the other governments through the embassies um, and keep sharing the positive stories because um, in this world where, where polarization is uh, well, it's very obvious at the moment as well. We need the good stories. We need the hopeful stories. We need the positive stories on why investing in education, in um, innovation is so key for an inclusive development. So keep up the good work um, communicate about it because I think we all need the stories of hope. Thank you so much, Pascala, for uh, your, your kind words and also your encouragement for uh, our community in the Orange Knowledge Program and, and all those that are sympathetic towards uh, the goals. Thanks very much and hope to see you soon again uh, with your um, uh, wonderful task ahead. Right, so um, we are now going to uh, finally uh, head to, towards the audience. Um, I, I couldn't hide my curiosity uh, and I would love to know, we would all love to know uh, where you're from. So the way um, to you know, spot yourself on this uh, global map is uh, to go to your screen in uh, the bar, you see view options. There you have uh, a couple of options. If you can click that one, you will find uh, one option which is called annotate. You will also see instructions now in the chat. And when you click annotate, you find a bar where you have one option to stamp. For example, I already see that Mark, our uh, colleague from Nuffik, is there, Agnieszka, uh, we have, um, we see live now uh, several people uh, stamping their location into the world map and um, it's wonderful. Uh, we also saw somebody with very creative drawing uh, talents, that's also great. <laughs> And um, I'm also excited to see that we have someone uh, who is located in the middle of Africa. Uh, we have somebody uh, in the south of Africa and uh, the west. Uh, we actually have uh, South America or middle America also being uh, represented. And of course, do we see Indonesia? I think we see Indonesia or yes. That's a wonderful thing. Um, and indeed, um, the, the, the person uh, from Central Africa was from Rwanda, I think. And then we also have someone from Nigeria. That's great to find out. Thank you uh, for you know, uh, highlighting your location. It gives a, a, a feeling that we're all close uh, to, to one another, but still you know, many, many miles away. Now, it would also be wonderful uh, to see in which domain you work. Um, so uh, we would like to show you a poll right now. And uh, that, in that poll, you can actually indicate uh, in which uh, domain you work. For example, in TVET, in higher education, in research, in the NGO sector, public sector, the private sector, or of course, there's other categories that wouldn't fit into this pool. So it would be uh, wonderful to see where, um, uh, where you're working in. And uh, let me give you another five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And then can we see the results of the poll? Can you? Can you see uh, the results of the poll here? Yes, I think we have a very high representation uh, from people in the higher education sector. Of course, also including um, uh, the, the universities, uh, but also other institutions. We also have quite some uh, representation from uh, the NGO sector. 
22 uh, percent the public sector and um, uh, also um, some TVET colleagues, which is uh, great to see. And uh, in the chat, uh, we also um, uh, see that uh, there's, there's a more nuance to uh, the domains we work in. Some people can't choose bec because they work in several sectors. I'm one of those, so I'm not gonna fill it out. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, I would uh, now like to head uh, to uh, our um, uh, next keynote speaker, another of those great women pushing the education uh, dossier forward. It's uh, Roos Hogenkamp, very welcome Roos, uh, who is manager of the NUFIC uh, Global Development Program. And of course, uh, your spearheading the Orange Knowledge Program, uh, which is a, a, a great collaboration. Roos, I would pass the floor to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Also, on my behalf, a warm welcome to all the partners that have joined us from all across the globe. I would like to thank Pascale Grotehuis of the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs for her keynote and the important messages she just gave us. I think all of us will recognize a lot of what she has just mentioned. But also thank you for your continued support for the Orange Knowledge Programme. These partner days have truly been an international effort of co-creation and we are delighted that we can continue in that spirit today. In the last two weeks, during the seven sessions preceding this Impact Day, we have had the pleasure of digitally welcoming people from all over the world. Long before the COVID-19 pandemic took hold of our daily lives, we had set out theme for the partner days, shared challenges and opportunities, present and future. And with the developments of the past year, this team has become a guiding principle for our work. If there is a lesson to be learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, it is that we can only face these challenges if we join forces, like Pascala also mentioned. And this is reflected at the moment by efforts of global pharmaceutical companies in developing vaccines. But it is also reflected in our work, where you have shown that global collaboration and education leads to development for all. The TVET and higher education sector as a whole is faced with a daunting task. How to make sure no one is left behind in a time of great uncertainty? As the academic year unfolds, we see in more detail all the effects this unprecedented pandemic entails. Student mobility and scholarships have taken new meaning when physical travel isn't always possible. We learned from our partners that onboarding students to a digital platform is not nearly the same as welcoming them in a grand ceremony on site, or what to think of letting them experience our strange Dutch eating habits like stroopwafels or a broodje croquette, and how to set up new projects, trainings or alumni activities when whole countries or regions are in lockdown. The shift from residential to remote learning does not only affect teachers, staff and students. On a fundamental level, the pandemic challenges the very structures and experiences that constitute TVET and higher education. Issues such as digital divides, equity and equality of opportunity shift even more into focus. The very chance that an entire generation will be excluded from education is real, with girls and women especially being in danger of being left behind. In the media, all focus is on the possibility of securing a vaccine as soon as possible. Understandably so. A human tragedy unfolding immediately before our eyes should require all our attention. But the disruption caused by this coronavirus does not end when a vaccine is widely available. Over a billion students globally are affected in one way or another. A large number of already at-risk youth are completely shut off from education. Some higher education institutions have transitioned smoothly to distance learning, but this has not been the case for the majority. Although the crisis sparked a period of innovation by our partners, you have also highlighted that no perfect online substitute exists for in-person, people-to-people contact, which has always been a vital element in building sustainable partnerships. 
For those of us who work on internationalization of education, these challenges are increasingly part of our reality. And we are combating them, knowing that they're not singular problems that can be addressed by our endeavors alone. They need concerted efforts. And it's exactly in this regard that we have seen the strength of all the partnerships within the Orange Knowledge Program. Because in these past eight months, you as partners of the Orange Knowledge Programme have shown your resilience and have done so with a sense of unison and togetherness. In some cases, almost overnight, innovative strategies for onboarding new students were developed. Switches to blended learning were made. Transitions to online learning and tools and platforms took place in the span of more weeks, sometimes more deep days even. And we have seen how our partners reached out to each other to learn of novel approaches, to exchange experiences and ideas on improvement. You have stretched yourself to adapt to the unexpected, and for this, you have our appreciation. We cannot express sufficiently how impressed we are with all your efforts so far. But we're not there yet. As stated before, today we are connected through a concept of shared challenges and opportunities, present and future. In the thematic sessions of the last two weeks, you have shared what those might be from your perspective. We have discussed the themes emerging during these last months, such as a need for a different perspective on digitalization and its effect on education in times of a global pandemic, or how the international classroom is of added value to students and knowledge institutions alike. We have forayed into crucial themes for partners in West Africa, ranging from alignment to youth strategies and labor market needs. With an increased attention to the outcomes of our efforts, we have especially looked at what this requires from a monitoring and evaluation point of view. And on Monday, we went even more into depth how COVID-19 can be a force for change. A session on inclusive development followed Tuesday, and we ended our thematic session with an outlook on building sustainable partnerships. Today, in Dr. Joanne Marlene Bewa's keynote speech, we will continue this journey with our gaze shifting to the sustainable development goals. And like you, I'm very much looking forward to hearing her later on. Because that is what this partner day, this impact day is truly about. Building for a better future through education. You have all probably heard or read our motto, education is the engine for growth. It is with that conviction in mind we started in 2017 and we continue with this guiding principle. We are still convinced that the best way of achieving this growth is by sharing opportunities and combining skills and knowledge in interdisciplinary ways. That is why we at NUFIC Global Development constantly strive to incorporate the strengths and expertise of all our partners into a diverse program. Regardless of our seven decades of experience, it is our ambition to both progress this process of learning and sharing with all of you. We have learned from the many training courses impacting more than 2,000 people last year alone. These people become in turn ambassadors for the knowledge they have received, adding their voices and strengths to the thousands of alumni of the Orange Knowledge Program. A vast multitude of scholarships Institutional collaboration projects, tailor-made trainings and alumni activities were designed and implemented in the last three years. We've also learned from our new partners in, for example, Iraq and Jordan, who have joined the program last year. Our increased efforts in the Sahel and Horn of Africa resulted in new partnerships, building bridges between unexpected partners who share a common vision of prosperity and stability. We undertook further regional activities last year, resulting in additional calls for high quality education for refugees and host communities and fragile states to adapt better to the actual context of our focus. We launched one of our largest institutional collaboration projects to date in Ethiopia on bright future in agriculture. Having said that, people in Ethiopia are facing very difficult times at the moment and our thoughts are with them. In Mozambique, we were able to contribute through an education on the job course to the rebuilding of homes devastated by Cyclone Idai. The list of highlights is much longer than the time awarded to me today. 
But know that these are just a few examples of how the Orange Knowledge Programme has moved in parallel with the shifts in the world around us. By the end of the programme's duration, we will have impacted more than 50,000 people and their communities. Synergy with other local and international initiatives, complementarity and an integral approach with instruments all require a certain amount of flexibility. And that is why we do not shy away from improve, improving the programme where the need arises to be more flexible. This constant adaptation combined with an outlook on the future, that is what also joins us today. No matter how the pandemic evolves in the months and maybe years ahead, the groundwork for positive change is laid with every small step taken. All of us joining digitally is one such step. Sharing and disseminating the knowledge learned today is another such step. Looking back on what has been done and reflecting on these activities is another way to improve actions for the future. We are constantly on the lookout for different perspectives intent on including all voices. We have tried to do this in the past, in the thematic sessions of the partner days, and continue to strive to do so in the future. This is why, as manager of the Orange Knowledge Program, we look towards our partners, old and new. Today, we are joined by many of them, such as the esteemed members of our advisory board and sounding board, but also by the Impact Award jury, whom you will meet later today. One of which is an alumnus from a predecessor of the current program of almost 30 years ago. In an interview leading up to the Impact Awards jury deliberations, Andrew Mumbagori mentioned how doing his masters in the Netherlands shaped his outlook on the world, that he himself could be an agent of impact and positively impacting his community as he could progress in life. This resonated deeply with me as it shows why it is so important to approach internationalization of education as a process of creating impact for communities. I would like to conclude by saying thank you for being here with us today, and we hope you will continue to join us in our journey. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rose, for this inspiring speech. And also, you know, it gives us uh, really uh, something to work with uh, for this, this morning. And um, what I would just be very curious about, huh? this, you give this whole overview, et cetera. Now, what are you steering this program? What are you personally most proud of? Mm. Well, I must say I'm proud of many things, of all our partners in the Netherlands and all countries we work with, and of, of course of all the students who participate in our programs. Uh, but I'm also a proud manager, proud of all my colleagues in the Netherlands, Jordan, Lebanon, South Africa, Benin and Indonesia, who work hard on accommodating the adaptations in the program. Nearly all of them were working from home for months and dealing with the limitations that came together with COVID-19. And running a program such as the Orange Knowledge Program is essentially the work of people, collaborating with people. And I personally think we did a good job in this respect. That's great to hear. And I also think that uh, that is rewarding for those people working on this program uh, every day and those that are going to be involved uh, uh, in the future as well. So thanks a lot, uh, Rose, for this, um, this boost. I think uh, now we're going to move to the next part of the program. And that is uh, looking back, as Rose already uh, hinted at, uh, looking back to the next, uh, to, the, to the last two weeks, and on the 16th of November, there was this first session, uh, the future is orange, and um, I'm delighted uh, to also have with us Justine Blanford of ITC Twente, uh, ITC stands for International Institute for Geo Information Science and Earth Observation. Now, uh, Justine, you've been doing a um, uh, session on digital transformation for higher education, very, very relevant. And you um, uh, did a survey conducted, um, uh, you also presented a survey conducted by the ITC earlier uh, this year. Now, 
there's many in the audience, you know, who, who, who are into this, in the middle of this digital transformation. Now, what would be your advice um, to uh, the knowledge institutions who are struggling with this uh, digitalization a bit? Justine. Thank you very much. Um, so I can, can you hear me okay? Yes, good, uh, just checking. Right, so I think um, from our session, I think some of the things, and we've heard about uh, this too from the two keynotes just now. Um, well, first of all, digitalization is here to stay. So how can we make sure that everybody has a good experience? One thing to do is to send surveys to both your staff and to your students in the same way that we did, and we will continue to do so, so that we can uh, identify what those barriers are and then try to fix them. Some will be beyond our control, as we've heard, uh, access via internet. So how do we fix those problems? Those are bigger problems beyond what the institution can deal with because that's based on internet providers in, so, in many cases. Um, but so we need to think about the things we can fix. So uh, on a, you know, on a day-to-day basis in our curriculum, things would be that that were highlighted for us would be fine tuning interactions. How do you set up interactions in your courses so that they are meaningful? Um, group projects, a lot of students struggled with the group projects to start with because of figuring out how to communicate with each other and to work efficiently, which we normally do face to face. So we have to think of how to overcome uh, those barriers. Um, one thing we did see is that staff were highly motivated to try new types of teaching and, and find solutions. Um, so one thing we have to continue to do is to figure out how to reward the effort that gets put into that um, and to build communities, as we've heard within here, communities of practice where we can share things openly. Uh, and learn from each other, uh, but also learn from our students, because our students are used to also trying out and finding new things. So to have them in the loop to feed back to us as to what works well and what doesn't. Um, uh, other things, uh, I, think the, I think the end goal is to figure out how we can continue to deliver quality education that is accessible and flexible. Uh, because we're all going through many different uh, things within our home. So how do you set up the courses so that um, it's, uh, uh, there aren't any time restrictions, uh, you know, immediate time restrictions so that you can develop things that are both synchronous and asynchronous. And by that, I mean, you know, instead of having all face-to-face -face meetings to set it up so that maybe through blog discussions where students are interacting that way and can come in and out of the, the course uh, when uh, time permits them if they have to also look, at, uh, look after uh, kids or family members. I think, uh, and then one other thing that, that came through for us was uh, the time it takes to grade uh, and the effort that goes into that. So uh, being conscious of setting up um, the, the assessments that you want your students to do, but taking in, into consideration the time that it takes to grade those so that you can still give good feedback, but also so that it doesn't become a burden on you. And I think those are probably the key, the key pieces. And I think what we have to work towards is that balance between technology and the real world. So that, you know, I, I think Pascal um, uh, highlighted, you know, some community, you know, the, the digital divide that has has been shown here and not only um, between gender but between age so that we have communities that uh, our local communities are also uh, being enabled and can can balance between technology in the real world i think that's probably it <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Justine, and and that uh, is is both you know a a insight uh, into what came out of your session, but also some practical tips and tricks 
uh, that uh, our audience uh, can work with. Let's let's uh, see what um, uh, what the audience uh, thinks about uh, relevant topics that we should take on. Uh, what topics would you uh, like to discuss more in depth next year? And please go ahead and um, fill out the poll so that we can see um, uh, what topics you would like to work on. We have security and rule of law, sexual and reproductive health and rights, which have been stressed a lot by the former uh, keynote speakers, um, water, energy, and climate, food and nutrition sec uh, security, of course, digitalization, but also, crucially, impact of education on youth, as Pascala also mentioned. So let's see uh, what uh, came out of this poll. We're very curious to find out. Yes, here we see um, what uh, the audience finds very important. And indeed, it's that impact of education on youth. And many uh, of you uh, would indeed feel forward-looking that that is uh, the, the theme to work on. And that also matches very much what the Orange Knowledge Program is, uh, is right now focusing upon. And of course, also digitalization. Um, so this is wonderful to hear. Um, I think now we're gonna move to the next uh, session, which was organized, thanks Justine, of course. Um, the next session, which was organized uh, the day after, uh, on the 17th of November, uh, impact for the sustainable development goals, which were already uh, highlighted by the keynote speakers. Um, here, uh, this was organized by uh, Wageningen, uh, but of course, um, uh, we we have somebody else uh, presenting this, the, the uh, moderator, Armand Raukema. Armand, could you tell us a bit more about what came out of uh, this session? Yes. Sorry, do you see me? I just, um, can you see me? And can you hear me? Yeah, okay, good. Um, thank you for um, presenting my um, my feedback on this um, session on uh, impact monitoring. It's especially about the post project and post training monitoring, which we had been discussing in this session. We had some uh, very wonderful presentations of uh, Wageningen and MSM, who provided tools, or instruments, and strategies how they were preparing also the measurement of post impact monitoring. Um, I would like to say just short some some tops and tips and eh? what what went very well and what went uh, where can we learn from. Uh, as a top, I would say that uh, we also received very good feedback from a number of um, partners from Indonesia, South Africa, Uganda. Um, it was also we could also see in the chat box that there were were also questions asked and examples given by people uh, from our focus countries. Uh, it was a lively discussion in our chat box, which also showed a number of things. Um, first of all, that 80% uh, uh, is clear about the need that also educational institutions are responsible and for measuring post-impact monitoring. Um, they see it also as an opportunity and to evaluate, uh, to, to improve the methodology and effectiveness of their projects. Um, also to, to see it as an opportunity to improve the measurement of training and education effects. Um, we also had a number of uh, questions about how to visualize this. Uh, um, there were examples of um, good practices how to improve the visualization uh, of, of impact, especially the contributions to the sustainable development goals is a very important factor um, it is for us crucial that, um, that we also report on how OKP as a program contributes to these SDGs. And for this, we really have to, um, yeah, we, we, we really need the project implementers to uh, come in with good practices, examples, um, and clear 
testimonials of individuals within projects, how they have been able to uh, act as change makers in their own domain, whether it be food and nutrition security, uh, sexual reproductive health and rights or water. In all these domains, we need especially testimonials of, of participants who really showed clear cases how they could make a change in their, in their, in their um, position, in their, in, in their work, in their organization. Um, now, how about creating visibilities? We, uh, we got examples uh, that you can do this through infographics, through human interest stories, uh, through the reporting on indicators that Nothic has uh, been prescribing in its own uh, monitoring and evaluation framework. Uh, but you could see that uh, there are already lots of good examples and good practices going on. We still need to wait eh, for the, the first reporting on, on impact monitoring. Uh, the OKP projects are still in implementation. EMT training programs are still in implementation. But after one, three to five years, we really would like to see also that um, implementers uh, can show us very nice uh, cases, how impact has been achieved, how we have shown contributions to sustainable development goals. Now, as a, as a, as a tip, I could say that um, for nothing, it is important to facilitate in a continuous process this, this uh, preparation of uh, post um, project, post training monitoring, um, as especially the need to, uh, to exchange experiences, to exchange uh, good practices with regard to uh, impact monitoring will also be a need for the coming year. Um, uh, next year, we'll have the, the last year of uh, OKP implementation. And then it's also very important that um, the implementers will prepare their, 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 the way they are going to visualize impact. Um, now, now uh, I think there's also something where, where NIFIC can do more. Uh, NAFIC should also help project implementers to, um, to create yeah, new events, new discussion platforms, um, also use the suggestions and the, and the questions in the chat box during the event to continue, uh, especially a dialogue with project implementers, how to, uh, how to improve also the way we can concretize and visualize the, the clear uh, attributions with regard to the SDGs. Uh, so there's still a lot to learn in, uh, in, 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 in this process. And uh, this event was a uh, first uh, kickoff to, um, to, to, to show what we have already done, what implementers have already been doing, and what still can be done. Uh, so for me, it was a very strong learning uh, process. Uh, Yuli uh, did also a very good job in um, explaining the monitoring and evaluation framework with regard to the, um, to the capacity development and, uh, and the thematic. Uh, indicators we use for uh, for measuring contributions to SDGs, but uh, well, this is this is really a good beginning. How we can learn from each other to um, well, yeah, to to show the effects and uh, the good success of OKP. Thanks very much, Armand, for sharing your key takeaways uh, with us. And, uh, you know, impact, that is something that I'm sure uh, the audience also has opinions about. So uh, we would like uh, to know from you um, uh, the following. What, with regard to the impact for SDGs, uh, what is the biggest challenge in this regard, do you think? sufficient sources, I think that one is coming up now. Beneficiaries are difficult to reach. That could be with remote areas or uh, because of no digital means. Assessment of attribution, prioritizing uh, impact. Um, yeah, this, this was one of the questions that we also put forward in the poll during the session. And um, the answer on that question was uh, especially sufficient resources. Uh, I thought it was at least Great. 50 percent. We don't want to influence the audience on this one. Okay. So let's, this, let's you want hear, to raise the question again? Okay, good. Yeah, let's hear what the audience has to say here. And I think your prediction, Armand, is um, <laughs> might be uh, uh, might be indeed. Let's uh, let's take a look at the results of the poll. Uh, 
Um, yes. Armand, I think uh, your, um, your prediction was right. Uh, sufficient resources is for 45% uh, of the audience, the biggest challenge with regard to impact for SDGs. And of course, um, to do this um, uh, monitoring from the beginning, uh, that indeed is also a challenge when you're still initiating, et cetera. So, um, thanks very much, um, Armand. Uh, also, thanks to the audience again for sharing your uh, ideas uh, through the polls and, and your own priorities and concerns. Uh, then I would like to move to uh, the next speaker, Reem uh, al -Kader. Um She's from uh, Jordan and she is going to touch on uh, that topic that uh, already the keynote speakers uh, touched upon. Uh, how do we deal with uh, the challenges around uh, the pandemic for knowledge collaboration? We're still continuing, but how um, do we deal with that concretely? Reem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be uh, here with you today. Um, I'm from Jordan, but I am very proud to be a NOFIC uh, <laughs> representative in the region for OKP program. Uh, thank you for the speakers. I, I need to see this. Thank you to Rose and Pascal, because I will uh, quote Pascal when she said, we all need stories of hope. This was in the heart of our session that we discussed. Uh, COVID-19, it was forced for change. Uh, we uh, moved from challenges to opportunities. We tried to think positively in this um, uh, difficult time. So we had two uh, very lovely presentations. Uh, the first one from uh, Center for Development Innovation. It was about how uh, we find opportunities when we uh, want to, uh, uh, what and, and the impact when we uh, change the courses fully uh, online, uh, the um, course delivery system, what happened, how was it impacted, uh, the way forward, how could we go forward, how to cope with it. Uh, we are forced uh, by this um, uh, pandemic to, to be fully online. Uh, what could we do? What, uh, what did it work? What didn't work? And we have this uh, lively discussion. The second presentation, the second keynote speaker uh, was from uh, TU Delt. That's sorry, and uh, it was about project management to take that also into consideration because because it was uh, also influenced too. Uh, how to reach the long term impact, how to uh, be more adaptive, how to be more inclusive, the long term what's widespread use of digital resources, um, how to have products that are not time dependent, uh, the future uh, vision may be for hybrid training. Um, we are facing by accelerating the transition, uh, how to get uh, our energy uh, online to online learning. Um, it, this is like uh, everybody agreed, it is a forever change. Uh, it will stay. Uh, so we uh, should accept and reprioritize um, our work. Uh, the lessons uh, we got from the breakout sessions uh, uh, they 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 wanted more time to discuss things that and they wanted to discuss this uh, even further maybe in a next session or uh, next time um more people they said that in the positive side more people can join the training now because there's no international travel so uh, the content is widely uh, more spread more shared with more people um and to quote one of the participants he said uh, now we can reach every corner in the world. So this is also one of the aims of digitalization in this um, uh, time. Uh, the second uh, positive remark was that uh, this brought colleagues, people working in the same field together. They are now sharing their experiences amongst themselves because everyone are struggling. They are all struggling, so it's time to to share among themselves how to face these challenges. Uh, the two challenges they uh, talked about is how to approach new partnerships because it is online and we are meeting people online. It's very difficult to include new partners and to reach new partnerships and uh, how to cope with the acceleration of knowledge um, to be more absorbent and to um, uh, move on. So, 
and in the conclusion, we um, we had uh, I had thrown this uh, big idea that uh, life uh, doesn't get better by chance; it gets better by change. And uh, we we hope that we change something into um, a, a positive um, um, uh, impact for for uh, for everyone. So the, these were in a nutshell the takeaways from the uh, session we had. Wonderful yeah. to hear you. <laughs> Thanks for Thank for sharing those. And I have the the feeling this is all also gonna gonna come back in our looking forward uh, uh, plan uh, later in the morning. Uh, there are so many uh, different um, uh, things. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, reprioritization. You know, you have to reinvent yourself as well with new skills, etc. Uh, but also this this element of change. Now, of course, we're very curious to to see also um, what uh, the audience thinks about this. Um, what uh, you know, with the Corona crisis being uh, a force for change, what do you think is uh, the biggest challenge right now? Is it transition to remote learning? Is it didactic methods for teachers? reaching marginalized groups that also Pascala referred to, uh, infrastructure needed for internet connectivity. I mean, there's places in the world where, you know, it's just not available or too expensive. Uh, funding for rebuilding educational uh, systems, um, et cetera. So let's see what is most important uh, what is the biggest challenge rig uh, 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 according to the audience that is reaching marginalized groups yeah 47 percent is that something that you recognize as well Reem? very much i uh, do uh, very much agree because also we we in jordan um, and in the region we have um many uh, refugees um so they are living uh, they are um marginalized they uh, need uh, more attention and uh, so yeah i could very much relate uh, to that uh, it's it's uh, it's it's different from country to country but i think this is the the most challenging uh, for 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 the future great reem and also your quote is being picked up by <laughs> <laughs> yes, in the chat and yeah, yeah. Uh, life doesn't get better by chance it gets yeah. better by change Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Reem. Yeah. And we go to the next yeah, but... uh, which um, is on inclusive development. I already saw that as one of the suggested priorities in the chat uh, before. And there we have a very experienced professional, Lindy van der Liet of the Royal Tropical Institute. Lindy, um, can you share with us uh, what uh, are the key takeaways from your session? Yes, thank you, Mariah. Uh, very happy to do so. I'm very happy with the bridge that Reem just made and the public uh, and all the audience made on really targeting marginalized groups, because of course that's what this whole session was about, leaving no one behind, the central three theme of the SDGs. And I think uh, we had a very active audience and very good participation in this session because everybody is super motivated to really make sure no one is left behind. Um, and it's more urgent than ever with COVID only making existing inequalities bigger. And I think um, the main takeaways from the group uh, were the following. Um, one is actually that we have to be really ex explicit about taking a very integrated approach around inclusiveness. Uh, I mean, people have multiple identities. They are either a man or a woman or something even in between. They have sexual preferences. They have different ages. They have different economic social status. So it's all of these parts of identity that actually uh, make people more prone to being excluded. And um, this more integrated approach to, uh, to inclusion was really echoed by the full group and also by the speakers. 
which was interesting because they were speakers that are intervening at more higher policy levels, speaker from UNESCO, who is really stressing that such an approach really helps in getting governments on board on more inclusive education, health services, or any other intervention in their countries and regions, but also from the preventer, uh, presenters uh, with concrete programs, OKP programs in Bangladesh and Mozambique. So that was one, a, a strong uh, focus on an integrated approach on inclusiveness um, to really exclude no one and to really leave no one behind. And the second thing that really came from the group, uh, once you know who these people are who are being excluded, and of course that differs per context, uh, the form of exclusion that they experience, it is really important to um, to include these people also in the design, in the monitoring, in the decision making uh, of the programs. And I think um, this is something we know. We've learned this already in the past from uh, we know how important it is to ma make youth uh, uh, um, uh, to, to uh, advocate for more meaningful participation of youth. Um, but still sometimes we forget, and maybe it is because we are so all driven by uh, wanting to realize uh, impact and wanting to program and, and quickly, and we are, there's an urgent need, right, for us all to intervene because uh, we really want to be those advocates for change, as Reem just addressed. But in our hurry, we might sometimes really forget to um, include those people that we really target in our programs. So uh, our conclusion was, um, uh, yeah, program and, 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 and discuss uh, uh, not about people or for people, but really with the people that, you, uh, that are at risk of exclusion. And those can be many, actually. So um, yeah, those I think were the really two main takeaways. And um, everybody is really motivated to start working uh, together in, in that way to really leave no one behind. And also we, personally myself, I was really inspired by, uh, by the group. And uh, still a thank you group to all of you. And uh, maybe if you have any additions in the chat, feel free to add if any of you are there. Indeed, and thank you very much, Lindy, also for your passionate plea uh, to, to make inclusive development work uh, in practice, in the field, from the beginning. And we're very curious to hear what uh, the audience uh, would have to say about that. Um, when it comes to leaving no one behind, uh, what is relevant for your country uh, or region? Is it gender imbalance? Uh, is it indeed those marginalized groups? Access to education? Is it adequate curricula? Or social reform, a more, you know, a broader uh, umbrella of this? Um, so if you um, can indicate your preference, then uh, we would like to see uh, the results now of this poll. And let's see, yes, indeed, it's again uh, those marginalized groups, 28% uh, of you who voted uh, actually highlighted uh, marginalized groups as being uh, the most relevant for your, your country or region. Fantastic. And thank you very much, uh, Lindy. Now we go to the last session that was organized in Looking Back. And uh, that is Nusrat. And Nusrat is from Bangladesh. Um, you're, um, you have organized a session on challenges and opportunities of building sustainable partnerships. Now that, of course, as we also um, heard before, networking is bit more tricky in this in these times i'm sure um you have uh, uh, your thing to share about your session Nusrat. thank you so much thank you for this opportunity and what a wonderful session i've learned so much and also resonate the past speakers talk about on inclusiveness um, but let me just go to partnership for now. We, um, I'm Nusrat Aman with IAT Education. We are engaged in a project with Orange Knowledge Program on, um, it's called Stitch. And we are co-designing a curriculum uh, 
for improving occupational health and safety for garments workers in Bangladesh. And um, in our discussions yesterday, we talked a lot about partnership and how partnership should actually be. We talked about uh, mutual respect. We talked about reciprocity. We talked about equal partnership. So um, I guess a couple of things that came up uh, from there was the fact that in terms of reciprocity, we often uh, define partnerships as how the knowledge flows from global north to global south. But perhaps we may need to think deeper on how to also bring in knowledge from the global south to global north uh, through an exchange program, through knowledge sharing, and which should be part of a continuous process, not in one off, but a continuous process where we have opportunities to learn from each other. And then when we talked about mutual respect, a couple of things came up where um, we felt upon discussion yesterday as well is that it's, it's important to have all partners engaged in co-designing a, a project you know, just when you design the project, when you co-create things, it is important to have everyone at the table. And um, when we talk about equal partnership, you know, there has been a, something that has been raised by different people from different region, also uh, from our uh, colleagues in Africa and in the Netherlands and other places is that, um, the beneficiaries or the other project partners in the global south don't really have a say in the financial allocations and accountability. But so in projects uh, to be a partnership, to be sustainable, it's important that everyone is recognized and everyone is incentivized for their efforts. So those are things that we talked about. and. Having said that, I also want to say that equal partnership does not necessarily mean financial benefits or financial remuneration always. Equal partnership is beyond that, but it is. this is something that should be talked about as well and perhaps reviewed. Another thing that uh, we talked about is of course the sustainability of a project, how we we always talk about making a project which is sustainable, but how what do we do for the projects to make sure it is either medium term or long term sustainable? So when we are looking at project, we must always think about uh, components beyond the life of the project. You know, how is this project going to impact the society that we are trying to create a change in? So how do you bring, uh, how do you scale for impact through these projects? That is something for long-term sustainability. Um, we felt that this was something which was truly, truly is, um, a point that we need to look deep into. And um, also, you know, for projects to be sustainable, we need to think about not just through the project, but activities which are around the project or but basically for partnership where you can build on different things, different opportunities to make the partnership last longer go, going forward, even when the project is no longer there. So I guess what I'm trying to say that is that, you know, projects face challenges and uh, there are a lot of um, constraints and there are structures that definitely need to be in place for projects to work um, well, but structure does not mean that you cannot have fluidity in projects. I mean, if we take agile creativity and learn from small steps, there should be provisions in projects where you can learn and you can identify the pain points and build on those, improve on those within the structure, but have sort of some mobility to improve on this. So I, these were um, some of the things that we talked about and I'm actually excited to, um, discuss this further as well in future sessions. So thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Nusrat. And uh, as you might see in the chat, there's lots of people uh, with uh, ideas uh, about that, that that sharing is, is definitely already happening. And 
some fundamental points that you bring up here, like, uh, like uh, equality in partnerships and, and how to promote sustainability, those small steps. So let's hear what the audience has to say about that. And what, what word or words do you associate most with the term partnerships? And I know that in some languages it's equal to marriage, but we're talking about, of course, <laughs> We talked about that as well. Is it like a marriage? <laughs> Is it working together? Collaboration? <laughs> Equality between partners, as Nusrat really, you know, highlighted. Is it maintaining a network? And mutuality? Complementarity? Or value addition? And access to resources, of course, that is something which you also need. So let's hear what you have to say about that. What are the terms you associate most? Collaboration, I think uh, that's a good one. And that's also really uh, the, the, the principle in our Orange Knowledge uh, program in that sense, uh, when it comes to partnerships and let's make that uh, last for long. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Nusrat. Thank you to the audience. Now we're, um, uh, I think, ready for a short break. Uh, we're going to come back at 11.45 uh, with another wonderful keynote speaker, so don't miss that. Um, you will now be automatically uh, redirected. Uh, you can also uh, stay in plenary. Um, I think uh, what is important is um, that uh, we're taking to account all the comments and remarks in the chat. We're bringing that together. And um, I'm very much looking forward to seeing you back at 11.45 uh, when we have the next speaker. Have a good break. I'm proud that my countrymen are resilient. <laughs> I think um, our togetherness is something that I'm very proud of. The unity in diversity. There's so much unity in diversity. I think it's one of the most beautiful countries that uh, is out there. Oh, that's a big question because <laughs> there are a lot of things I would love to change, but if I had to select one... I would like more democracy, can I say that? I wish we had more democracy in our country and um, uh, we had more inclusiveness. The people have a lot of capabilities, but they don't believe in that. That's the one thing I would want to change fast. Of course, that is the first thing. So <laughs> several others uh, that come with that entangled. Access to education, access to justice in Afghanistan, access to health. People just work for the government to do everything, but unfortunately the government can't do everything. And it's so sad that we see people are just sitting and wishing for something good to happen. I would like young people from my country to start working, acting for a change in the future. I would love to see um, a better country as in terms of infrastructure development, as in ensuring that we have the food security that we've always been working towards, and also making sure that people are all well nourished, you know, people are not malnourished in any way. They eat, get food readily available. There's peace, there's I mean, stability in the, in the economy of the country and also making sure that opportunities are available to all and not to certain selected group of people. I'd like to help my country and I couldn't imagine 
a job that's just for my own sake. Uh, I really wanted to try and live uh, to live somewhere different, in a different country, in a different, be exposed to a different culture, and um, also, uh, yeah, see the world probably. Netherlands is quite a small country, but the impact they have around the globe is very enormous in terms of capacity building, giving out skills, giving out opportunities to the less privileged. For instance, I can't afford to come to the Netherlands to study. I don't have that. Fo I don't have that fund, but I got that through that platform. Oh yes, it was a sacrifice being away from home. I'm married. I have a. I had a child by then who was four years, and separating from the family was a bit hard for me. I had to sacrifice family <laughs> and friends. I'm not married yet, but I have a girlfriend. I may say my drive to wanting to to get the skills that I had come for was much more than the challenges that I was going through. So I also felt like I am privileged as a citizen from my country to be an ambassador for them and be able to represent them. And so I was ready to do that for my country, for my family and for myself. I expected that it, will, it would be really cold, <laughs> but I didn't expect that it would be that cold. <laughs> What's really beautiful about the Netherlands is the relationship of the country and the culture with the water in general, which is something very unique because they're supposed to be drowning <laughs> right now. They're supposed to be underwater. But the way that they actually developed a relationship with, with that um, risk, if you can call it that, is, is very interesting to see. When I go back to my country, I want to help the people in a more direct way. I want to be able to help improve resiliency. I want to take the knowledge and the skill. And uh, for the shortest period of time that I've been here, I have seen the gaps that we have in our country, in the system. It's gonna change me a whole lot, like my, my perception on life, even perception on my own culture, like things like, I'm learning so much, like I'm learning, apart from um, water supply engineering, I'm learning like geography from the next guy, because you're talking to someone from a whole other country, learning new things, and everything is, so I think it's going to have a huge impact on me, it's going to improve my professional experience, and it's going to give me a different perspective that when I take back home, I'm going to make a whole lot of change. People are expecting us, they're already waiting for us. They run very high risk during the pandemic. Because they live uh, close together, they are overcrowded. I feel like we can serve them better. We cannot really put an health center from the government. For now, we do outreach services, and that is giving them a, a hot sort of hope. What I'm most proud of is when you get to the community and see the welcome the community members give you, and you see your staff that doing it willingly, I feel happy. This is what we do regularly in this community to bring health services to their doorstep. It's been a long journey that we are arrived here. We conducted a lot of uh, community mobilization. Our coverage moved from below 60 to 90%. The Orange Knowledge Program is a program that really will rely on you.
This is Ketutsu Manjasa from the Fishery University of Jakarta. With other members from his polytechnic, he participated in an exchange to the Netherlands. Before the, the project, we believe that we are the, the best. But after that, after we went to the Dutch, we went to some uh, vocational education uh, institution there. Inspired by what he saw in the Netherlands, he asked Dutch experts to collaborate. They developed an action plan and received funding through NAFIC. Wageningen University and Research offered new techniques in fish processing which make the uh, students better equipped for the labour markets. The Dutch strong focus on vocational education was introduced. A teaching factory was built on the campus. Students are now gaining a lot of practical experience. And blended learning was introduced to reach out to students in remote areas. We are opening up the possibilities to people that were before were excluded from this, this opportunities. So not only the curriculum changed, the school became more focused on inclusion. It also now offers girls like Arma an equal chance. Born in a small village in a remote part of Sulawesi, Arma was the first of her family to go to university. The first thing that I want to change is my family and my community. So this is my responsibility. So well-educated woman. So much for building better quality, inclusive and sustainable education together. Bridging culture differences asks for an open mind to really try to understand each other. We learned and thus create new knowledge which we again apply in other contexts. International collaboration uh, creates partnerships that uh, benefit us all. This is Rosemary Yvonne Naluwega, a police officer for the Uganda Police Force in Kampala. She heads the department that handles sexual offences, children cases and human trafficking. Rose also conducts trainings on behalf of the regional training facility, RTF. She trains police officers and other professionals how to deal with survivors and perpetrators of sexual and gender-based violence. In Uganda, 62% of the cases that judiciary handles are related to sexual and gender-based violence. Police officers deal on average with 10 cases a day, and those are only the reported cases. I realized that police officers, some of them were not aware of the laws against GBV, and they needed capacity building. So much as you try to investigate some cases, most of them were being thrown out of court because of poor investigations. And I thought I would really play a part to build the capacity of officers. First of all, by trying to train them on available laws on GBV, I would take them through the Domestic Violence Act I would take them through the Children's Act for their officers to know that the perpetrators should be punished. Most of the time, I would realize that perpetrators beat justice because they manipulate the system, and therefore you should have passion in you as an investigator to go through and make sure that these, these cases cannot continue. Impunity cannot continue. Criminals should face justice. The Orange Knowledge Program, funded by the Dutch government, supports the capacity development project, EIS, in which Rose plays a vital role. Through long-term collaboration between Dutch and Ugandan knowledge and training institutes, a sustainable change is made.
My name is Jacqueline Owili. I'm from Nairobi, Kenya, the land of uh, wild safaris. One of the things that made me choose uh, the Netherlands is because that uh, it's one of the major food exporting countries and also producers. I'm happy because I came here because I wanted to learn the Dutch culture, which is the biking culture. In a way, when I came, I didn't know how to ride a bike, but I was able to ride a bike when I came here. Currently, I'm pursuing international development studies at Wageningen University. And uh, this university is known as, uh, it's just been the top in the world in the world of agriculture and life sciences. But my major concentration is on sociology for development, whereby women and men are brought on the table to be able to have a, like a gender equality society. Uh, in terms of gender studies, like uh, it's given me like a perspective whereby it, it has opened up my mind. I'm, I'm, I'm being able to reason up um, looking at the gap that are back home in Kenya whereby there are no equal opportunities for women and men. So I wanted to know how the Netherlands is trying to uh, make their policies that are trying to bring all people at the same level. Well, this is something I can say, it's, it's so dear to me from the heart. Like uh, I can say I've, I've seen all the things that uh, women are going through in the society where the society has been so cruel to them. But currently we are trying to, the, the society is opening up. So it's like it's given me an open mind to think out of the box on how to bring an inclusive society together. And I'm so grateful for the new FIC, uh, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs for giving me this opportunity through the Orange Knowledge Program to be able to expand on my knowledge. Definitely, yes, I'm going to make a change. My first thing when I go back to Kenya is about community involvement and creating awareness in the community. Yes, I'm a change maker, yes, and it says that change begins with me before it goes to other people in the society. Yeah, we are the leaders of tomorrow, so yeah, I believe if you empower a woman, you empower the whole nation. That is my mantra. My name is Roa. I'm a dentist from Sudan. I work in the Federal Ministry of Health in Sudan. I've came here to study public health. I really wanted to come to the Netherlands. I love how it's embracing multiculturalism and how you will always feel like welcomed and accepted in here. And uh, it's one of the best countries in terms of uh, the public health. Um, I love uh, all the chances that I'm getting in here. One of the major problems in Sudan in the health system is um, health care quality. Most of people, they have to pay out of their pocket immediately and they will end up uh, in catastrophic expenditure and this will even, uh, we already have a problem with inequity, so they will, it will even increase the inequity in the country. It's really something that is not fair and, and I, I, I really, I really interesting in changing this because it, it pains a lot that when you see like really poor people and, and they don't have enough chances of getting the treatment that uh, they need. And uh, I think um, this is a right for every person. My master in here is about health system uh, management and policy. I will be able to get the knowledge, to get the tools, to know uh, how to solve them, what are the best practices. It's always, um, also very nice that uh, I, I found people from like 19 different countries. I can learn about the best practices in every country that they have even the same context and they have been through this, they have gone uh, steps on that and then uh, the, the knowledge that I get from here that can, can help me a lot. Well, when I go back to Sudan, I want to be like the first one who put policies for the patient safety and uh, the one who is aiming for, for their health equity and for having all the rights that they need. There is always hope. As much as we try, as long as we believe in it, there is always hope. And I'm never, never going to stop fighting for this. I'm here in the Netherlands because I'm looking for some answers to improve many of the problems in my country. Malnutrition, access to health, drugs, uh, addiction. I really want to change this stuff. I really love my country. country my country is an amazing, Colombia is an amazing country. But now it, it really hurts when you see a child with malnutrition because his parents are dead. 
for, for the world. The, the knowledge that I want to acquire here is want to know is, is about how the health system in other countries, how it works and how can apply this knowledge of the systems in my, in, my own, in my own country. And also, well, my master is in public health. So how the burden of the disease in other countries, because not only the Netherlands, I'm studying with people from Africa, from Asia, from, I don't know, it's, it's very different. I'm not learning about the Netherlands, I'm learning about the world. And with all that uh, knowledge, that sharing of the knowledge, that give me some tools to improve the health in my, in my country. I really hope so. The first thing when I come back, I, I want to use knowledge and start with a research group in public health. And after that, we can take that knowledge and give it to the, to the ministry and maybe to the government. Okay, this is our problems. How can we help for that? My biggest dream is change my health system and, and improve the health in Colombia. We'll see. In 20 years, let me know. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, probably. Not only in Colombia, also in Latin America. <laughs> yeah, there's a change in my career. My main motivation to come to study in Netherlands is to learn from Netherlands because it's a very tiny country but which is doing great in terms of development but especially in, in agriculture because I have a hobby in agriculture to support our farmers in my home country so Netherlands is doing great in terms of agriculture so I want to learn from their farmers and to learn in their institutions so that I may take the same knowledge and skills to go and, and impact even my communities. Actually, in Congo, we have many problems. There's a lot of conflicts and killings. So the issue that I want to support in it's especially to empower I mean, young people who don't have anything to do. Because whenever they are unemployed, they tend to be used in politics by some opportunist politicians. I want to support those guys not to, to be involved in themselves in politics, but at least to be working for themselves to, to earn something from agriculture because it will impact them by boosting agriculture sector, leaching for the security, but also supporting the country in terms of development by learning from different countries like Netherlands. So far, I've been staying in Netherlands for few, just a few months, but within those months, I've learned a lot because I had like three excursions to the field visiting farmers. So it is very amazing because I think even now, if they give me time and to go back in my home country, I have a lot to support them. So I have a lot to tell them. I'll have a lot to improve from what I've seen. So though challenges, they are on my way, but I think I will try my best possible to see, keep on trying. They will hear my voice, even though my voice is so little, but at least it will still contribute something positive to the society. I'm proud that my countrymen are resilient. <laughs> I think um, our togetherness is something that I'm very proud of. The unity in diversity. There's so much unity in diversity. I think it's one of the most beautiful countries that uh, is out there. Oh, that's a big question because <laughs> there are a lot of things I would love to change, but if I had to select one... I would like more democracy, can I say that? I wish we had more democracy in our country and um, uh, we had more inclusiveness. The people have a lot of capabilities, but they don't believe in that. That's the one thing I would want to change fast. Of course, that is the first thing. So, <laughs> Several others uh, that come with that, entangled. Access to education, ac access to justice in Afghanistan, access to health. People just work for the government to do everything, but unfortunately the government can't do everything. And it's so sad that we see people are just sitting and wishing for something good to happen. I would like 
young people from my country to start working, acting for a change in the future. I would love to see um, a better country as in terms of infrastructure development, as in ensuring that we have the food security that we've always been working towards and also making sure that people are all well nourished, you know, people are not malnourished in any way. They eat, get food readily available, there's peace, there's I mean, stability in the, in the economy of the country and also making sure that opportunities are available to all and not to certain selected group of people. I'd like to help my country and I couldn't imagine a job that's just for my own sake. Uh, I really wanted to try and live uh, to live somewhere different, in a different country, in a different, be exposed to a different culture. And um, also, uh, yeah, see the world, probably. Netherlands is quite a small country, but the impact they have around the globe is very enormous in terms of capacity building, giving us skills, giving out opportunities to the less privileged. For instance, I can't afford to come to the Netherlands to study. I don't, have that, I don't have that fund, but I got that through that platform. Oh yes, it was a sacrifice being away from home. I'm married, I, have a, I had a child by then who was four years, and separating from the family was a bit hard for me. I had to sacrifice family <laughs> and friends. I'm not married yet, but I have a girlfriend. I may say my drive to wanting to, to get the skills that I had come for was much more than the challenges that I was going through. So I also felt like I am privileged as a citizen from my country to be an ambassador for them and be able to represent them. And so I was ready to do that for my country, for my family and for myself. I expected that it, will, it would be really cold, <laughs> but I didn't expect that it would be that cold. <laughs> What's really beautiful about the Nazis is the relationship of the country and the culture with the water in general, which is something very unique because they're supposed to be drowning <laughs> right now, they're supposed to be underwater. But the way that they actually developed a relationship with, with that um, risk, if you can call it that, is, is very interesting to see. When I go back to my country, I want to help the people in a more direct way. I want to be able to help improve resiliency. I want to take the knowledge and the skill. And uh, for the shortest period of time that I've been here, I have seen the gaps that we have in our country, in the system. It's going to change me a whole lot, like my, my perception of life, even perception of my own culture, like things like I'm learning so much, like I'm learning, apart from um, water supply engineering, I'm learning like geography from the next guy, because you're talking to someone from a whole other country, learning new things, and everything is, so I think it's gonna have a huge impact on me, it's gonna improve my professional experience, and it's gonna give me a different perspective that when I take back home, I'm gonna make a whole lot of change. Great. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, I hope you had a wonderful break. And I hope you could also uh, enjoy watching uh, the experiences uh, that many uh, had uh, while studying or having a training in the Netherlands. And one of them was speaking about our relationship with water and indeed, it started raining outside. It's, it's, you know, nobody really talked about it, but all, all the students and uh, trainees, they know that uh, that is something that comes with the Netherlands. But fortunately, we're all back again inside. It's also the day of uh, Thanksgiving today, which actually takes us to the American continent because the American continent, it's still very early in the morning, but somebody got up very early in Florida and we're very honored to be joined by our next keynote speaker, Joanie Marlene Bewa. And um, she really is a, a thought leader and she's an action hero. Um, that um, uh, is going to share with us her uh, vision on um, especially uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the special status that 
uh, she has is that she's the United Nations Young Leader for the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and she's much more. I'm going to get you, um, take you through a list. She's a Fulbright Scholar. She's a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation goalkeeper for the SDGs. Um, and by training, she's a medical doctor. Uh, she's a health, public health researcher. Um, and uh, importantly, from you know where she um, she she's also uh, giving back to Benin, uh, where she's from. She's the founder of the Young Beninese uh, Leaders Association, and very much an advocate for women's and girls' health and rights. So, um, if this wasn't enough yet, uh, a short video uh, here about. Uh, Dr. Joanie Marlene Bewa. I promise you that being a young African girl is not a hurdle to overcome, but a force to be reckoned with. Because when you grow up, you will fight for women's health around the world. Gender equality should not be an exception, it should be the norm. You will rally women together saying, we are here and we are going to change the world. Yours in power, Dr. Joanne Marlen Bewa. Mrs. Bewa, we're very honored uh, to have you here. Please take the floor. Yes, I was muted so far, but I think now you can all hear me. Thank you for this uh, ex exciting uh, introduction. I'm very privileged and I'm very honored to be here. Good morning, distinguished guests from wherever you are in the world. Again, I'm excited to speak today at the Orange Knowledge Partners Day. For the past 10 years, I've been helping individuals, leaders and development organizations make the most effective decisions and impact in healthcare, in gender equality and education. So during this brief keynote, I will focus my presentation on three key themes. The first one will be about my pursuit of knowledge. The second one focused on strategies to strengthen existing partnership and incorporate innovation in partnership. And the third component of my presentation will focus on few recommendations to sustain your impact. But before we start, I have few questions to ask. Do you know that knowledge cooperation in education is key to reach not just each sustainable development goals, but all sustainable development goals? For example, knowledge can help improve education attainment, SDG 4 health literacy, SDG 3, gender equality, SDG 5, poverty, SDG 1, economic empowerment, SDG 8, can help build peaceful and stable societies, SDG 10, and many, many more SDGs. Do you also know that ensuring access to shared knowledge and its translation into intervention and program are key drivers to reduce inequalities, inequities, and poverty. Yes, I know you know those facts, and your presence here today is the ultimate proof of your commitment to help solve those urgent issues. But I want us to take five seconds. Uh, please type into the chat where you are joining from, from the world, which country you are. I know there are people in Africa, in Europe, in North America, in Asia and beyond. So please feel free to tap into the chat where you're from. But I want to take five seconds to ask you this question and you can reply to yourself or you can share that with the public as well. Why are you committed to build a better world through knowledge cooperation, partnership and education? 
what drives you and keep you awake? So my why started many decades ago in a beautiful country, Benin Republic in West Africa. As you can notice, I have a very cute accent every time I open my mouth because I was raised speaking my native language, Fongbe, and an official language, French. So I was raised in a middle-class family of two girls where my parents, our parents, strongly believed in the power of education. Even though they couldn't all complete high school or college, they knew the importance of education. Back then and still now, the Benin education system was and still one of the best on the continent, and it allowed me to build a strong background. When I was transitioning to high school, however, one traumatic event happened. At nine years old, I almost lost my life due to a traumatic event, which means I could not breathe anymore. So my parents rushed me to the nearest hospital where a provider, a medical doctor was able to make an accurate diagnosis and use his or her knowledge to bring my respiration back to normal. This defining moment for me could have prevented me to stay alive, could have prevented me to pursue my educational goals, all the knowledge that I wanted to acquire. But instead, it was a critical moment which made me choose my career trajectory and priorities, which is to become a medical doctor and give back to my community, to use my medical knowledge and science to help improve people's quality of life and beyond. And then another event happened. Having one of my best friends having an unattended pregnancy, practicing an, an abortion, and dying from the complication of those, uh, this abortion. This event not just prevented her to pursue her education, to pursue her educational goals, but it also took her life again away from her. And at this moment, I decided to focus my work on healthcare, but women's health specifically, looking at sexual and reproductive health, but also look beyond this aspect, looking at the other social determinant of health that affects someone's health, meaning education, access to employment, knowing your rights and being empowered, and many more other social de determinants of health. And this really brought me, this traumatic event, these personal stories brought me to decide to, to develop and establish in 2010, the Young Beninese Leader Association, which is a platform, a nonprofit organization to address issue about reproductive health, gender equality, leadership, economic empowerment, and beyond. And recently, adding exchange program and scholarship opportunities for Benini students. So today I'm in front of you because after being exposed to various knowledge partnership in my country, Benin, in Europe and in US, I'm using my knowledge as a medical doctor, as a researcher, as a global champion to improve individual health, but also to strengthen youth participation, gender equality, while mobilizing effort around the world around sustainable development goals. So these two stories that I just shared with you are my why. What is your why? We cannot keep talking about knowledge without quoting a couple of quotes. Robert Boyce who said, Knowledge is power. And I think one of the, the, the ladies who was making a testimony also said that knowledge was power and that knowledge changed her life 
both the lady from Sudan, from Colombia, and the, 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 the serf from Congo, I believe, they also emphasize on the importance, the impact that being exposed to knowledge and opportunities has had not just on their own life, but their community uh, overall. So knowledge is power, definitely, and I support the statement, but knowledge that is shared is power multiplied. In fact, you know, knowledge cooperation is key to realize the sustainable development goals because they represent a key strategy to reach, as I said previously, not just one goal as a silo, but all SDGs. I have also been made aware that OKP program offers scholarship, training, institutional partnership between educational institutions and higher, and, uh, higher education while valuing development, transfer, and acquisition of knowledge. And I want to make a little transition about the current moment that we are living in right now, which is the current a pandemic to highlight the fact that yes, the current pandemic is posing several threats to knowledge cooperation and exchange. It is posing several threats to knowledge mobility. It is posing several threats to partnership. But we can flip the coin and look the other side of the coin. Because as John Kennedy said, in a time of turbulence and change, it is more true than ever that knowledge is power. So I'm coming back again to the statement made by your alumni, but statement made by other personalities who really believe that the power of knowledge is multiplied, but is even more powerful during moment of change and turbulence. And we definitely are in a time of change and turbulence at the current moment. For example, let's take a specific example. We know that TVET are very well placed to help develop important skills that are needed to mitigate important or urgent situations. TVET focus on practical skills has the potential to deliver short-term and targeted skills that are needed by essential workers, for example, either in the IT sector, the emergency response, healthcare, logistic, social work. Similarly, we can also consider the potential of scaling up and expanding TVET skills and skills building to respond to the current COVID-19 pandemic. Similarly, higher education are playing a key role in generating evidence and science to tackle the pandemic, but also are taking advantage of developing alternative and innovative learning modalities. So I believe it's really critical to strengthen capacity development during de delivery modalities, especially during the specific time that we are all going through. Looking at opportunities to expand and develop distance learning opportunities, as well as investing in improving the ecosystems that can enable such innovations. Universities, partners, communities, institutions, will all benefit from such quality remote learning capacities and infrastructures. But also looking at opportunities in difficult and challenging times, we know that the pandemic has uncovered gaps and learning opportunities in so many sectors. Let's take for example, the healthcare sector, which is my main area of work. We know that 70% of providers in the healthcare sector and social workers are women. We also know that the healthcare sector is employing and has been employing young professionals the most and remains the only sector over the past 10 years to continue to boom and grow even before a pandemic. So there is definitely a unique opportunity to leverage opportunities in the healthcare sector before, during and after this pandemic. Let's look at mobile health, let's look at telehealth Let's look at data sciences. Let's look at emergency preparedness, for example, and risk management. Those are key area that needs strengthening in terms of addressing knowledge gaps, but also professional opportunities gaps. And I'm convinced that partners in this room and beyond this virtual room are eager to collaboratively 
define the most relevant sectors, the most relevant and needed skills and opportunities that they want to tap into based on the national context and national needs. But can we talk about knowledge without looking at partnership? I don't think. So that's transition to a third story, which is more a more positive story about partnership for the goal, partnership for global good. As I have been introduced, I founded the Young Beninese Leader Association in Benin 10 years ago. And one of our first programs, the Red Ribbon Campaign, was a partnership with 20 network of a youth organization and civil society to develop a health campaign addressing reproductive health and HIV, HIV AIDS, which luckily reached over 10,000 youth over a year. And we reached this goal by partnering, but also letting the community host individual consultation, defining the most relevant health subtopic and strategies that they want to address, but also guide us in terms of knowledge gap that they want to acquire. So we were able to mobilize 300 volunteers and reach 10,000 people. But for us, the most important was how did we define and design this partnership to reach these goals? Looking at how, where we are today, today where we're able to engage in, in high decision-making and influencing spheres, for example, advising couple of government, including in the past Benin government, on its youth volunteering program in Canada, et cetera. But also for us being able to sit in a couple of instances regarding the United Nations, WHO and other group. For us, there are a couple of lessons that we learned from this type of partnership. So I learned and my team learned that experiences from our experiences that innovation and partnership must go together. They cannot go, they cannot stand alone. Innovation and partnership must go together, must work together, and must cannot stand alone. Why? How can we explore combining and bridging the gap between innovation and partnership? Here are a couple of ways that we thought that it could help anyone, any institutions, actually, to look at innovation and partnership. We can look at new ideas, new ideas because change is uncomfortable but necessary. Change is uncomfortable, but necessary. Change is uncertain, but it is necessary. We can think outside of the bus and ensure that we bring on the table new ideas, new ways of thinking, ensuring, for example, that we have a gender lens or we bring an equity lens in our program. New ideas. Second, new process, new models, which can be acquired through co-creation methodologies and having a very clear bottom to top approach that encourage partners ownership and all partners ownership. New delivery formats, new delivery methods. There are many delivery methods depending on the type of intervention and program that you envision you know, that you are strengthening, both from an education perspective, a knowledge acquisition perspective, a skill transfer perspective, or even a program implementation perspective. New partners, bringing on board, yes, traditional partners, the one that we've already worked with for the past 10, 15 years, but also looking at new partners that can bring a new skill set and an addition to our, our mindset and our work. Looking at multi-sectoral collaboration, for example, government, non-government, private sector, but specifically non-traditional and new partners. I know there's been a conversation around how can we already, we have established partners, but how can we make sure that we bring on board new partners and that it works well? The only way to have an answer is to try that partnership and have some risk mitigation strategies in place, but also looking at new partners, track record in implementing and delivering results. Having champions as well, both sides also help new partnership survive and thrive. New partnership formats. New partnership formats can value co-leadership between partners from the global south and the global north. Value co-ownership, shared risk, 
shared decision making, shared power, which most of the time is not necessarily a reality, but it is a key determinant of having new partnership format by sharing powers equitably between partners. And I also look at, look at new funding mechanism and funding modalities, because we need to put our, our fund and our resources where our priorities are. And we might be able, especially in this time of, of, of pandemic, find new, more flexible or shorter or longer scale funding mechanism to implement. Currently, something that we have been involved in with the International Organization of Francophonie is to help them identify 60 plus organization in the 88 French speaking country around the world to provide grant over two a million euro dollars to those organizations that are working specifically to address the vulnerabilities during COVID-19 and beyond. So I really found those new ways of thinking through new funding, partnership, new partners, new delivery methods, new processes and ideas, couple of entry point and lenses that we can consider while bringing innovation and innovative lens in our program. But here are a couple of ideas and suggestions that I also find very important to consider before, during, and after building effective partnerships. The first question that I like to ask myself and I encourage all partners to continuously ask themselves is our social and business goal known by ourselves? What is our social and business goals and priority as an institution, as a company, as a university, as an implementing organization, as a donor? Do we want or are we focusing on short-term and problem-solving approach? Do we want to be a long-term and a more like a development approach? Or do we want to be one or the other and add an influencing and ecosystem change component to our social and business goals? I think that's a first component, that first question that needs to be asked and continuously answered throughout the partnership before, during, and after the partnership. The second question that I really think is critical to ask and, and provide an answer to is how align our, our social and business goals to the current partnership goals. I've seen a lot of great achievements by, by uh, OKP uh, through a couple of new FIC projects in SIL and, and beyond and other regions as well. And I think through those activities and through those projects, how are as, as a country, as a partner, as an institution, as an university, our own social and business goals are aligned with those partnerships. From a donor perspective, we may also want to look who, our, who are our primary partners? What are our criteria of choosing them and bringing them on board? And how can we bring new partners on board while remaining inclusive? So those are key food for thought that I think are critical to guide the development and sustain an effective partnership. But even beyond that, let's, for example, look at what type of collaboration match our focus area and business goals. Because collaboration formats can match the partnership type, but might not necessarily match your focus area and your business goal. What are the, who are the people? What are the processes? What are the organizational structures that we need to either strengthen or that we need to put in place to support our partnerships? What type of change do we need to achieve? So I think those are a couple of food for thought and questions that I ask myself anytime I'm ready to enter a new partnership, that I am in a partnership to make sure that I still continuously remain true to myself, true to my organization, and that change is continuously out there in that part of partnership. But again, we cannot measure our partnership without looking at our impact. 
because our impact is a key measure, a key indicator about how well we are doing or we are not doing. So we can have a better impact by actually integrating interventions from bringing together health programs and maybe add an education and literacy lens or a gender program and make sure that we reflect a sexual reproductive health lens or an economic empowerment program and make sure that we really reflect an, an, a, a wash water and, and, and sanitation and hygiene component into it or maybe a technology program and make sure that it really brings some economic empowerment and employability skills uh, to the beneficiaries. So I think integration at this stage is really critical. And I've seen a couple of projects, uh, both educational and, and, and project implementing countries that have some of those integrations. But I think our partnership and our impact can be strengthened if those type of interventions issue-wise are integrated. Because as suggested by the Sustainable Development Goals, those cross-sectoral approaches are key to define the impact because the impacts are also not just quantifiable in numbers, but they are also quantifiable in quality of life improved and other qualitative indicators. That is the reason why we need to put our priorities, we need to put our funding where our priorities are. And policies, political commitment and funding are all interconnected and critical in shaping partnerships. In this virtual role, room, I know we have policymakers who have the power to define partnership modalities, who have the power to scale up initiatives and impact. And I would like to really reiterate that prioritizing and continuing to invest fund in such program on the OKP is critical and has a ripple effect considering a high return on investment. I've watched a couple of videos of project led in Benin and Nigeria and beyond, and I really don't doubt, I really don't doubt based on my experience that this investment backed up with community need assessment and co-owned by communities and partners are making a significant difference and will make a more significant difference. One important piece that I want to highlight, one important piece of puzzle of this puzzle that I want to highlight are alumni. They are drivers of impact. Engaging alumni and using their knowledge to engage other young professionals is critical for ownership and sustainability as well. At the same level and maybe at different level that funding is critical to drive change, policy and political commitments critical to drive change, engaging a strong network of alumni and also engaging young people in respective countries also make a difference. So as you can remember from my story, if I didn't have access to healthcare, if I didn't have access to quality education, if I didn't have access to certain you know, quality uh, opportunities in my life, I would not certainly be here today to share my experience. So I really want to keep encouraging you to continue to make a change in your respective communities, to continue to build and strengthen the partnership that you're engaging in now, but also take calculated risk and think outside of the box and bring new partners on, on, on board. I really want to continue with you and others to challenge the status quo through my work with the Young Beninese Leader Association, but also through my other engagement, for example, my research, as some of you know, I'm also serving as a research associate here at the University of South Florida in the US while I'm running the Young Beninese Leader Association in Benin. I'm really looking at a future with optimism because optimism is key. And for us at YBLA, we are launching in a couple of weeks a global health and an international development fellowship guide to kind of really use the opportunities and the challenges that the current disruption is providing, which is an innovative virtual non-residential program to inspire, to guide, connect, and train the next generation of global leaders in Africa, America, and Europe to tackle issues in global health gender, education, and international development. We also really want to build on evidence to guide our programs. And we are currently looking at conducting a couple of formative research on adolescent sexual and reproductive health and rights in Benefers and beyond.
we are definitely open to discuss potential partnership with you and your respective uh, organization. So I really want to make sure that you continue to build strong, equitable, cross-sectoral partnerships that are driven by knowledge, by best practices, in order to lead positive impact in your community and globally. As I mentioned earlier in my keynote, I wanted to leave you with three key takeaway messages. And throughout this brief conversation, I shared those three key takeaways. But let me summarize them before I close my keynote. The first one is knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. But knowledge that is shared is power multiplied. Second takeaway message, partners driven, innovative centered are key to build effective, long lasting and impactful partnerships. Partners institutions are achieving in your respective countries, exceptional results that I have witnessed myself. And I'm sure that there are many more impacts to come. I've also shared a couple of ways to innovate in partnership and also a couple of lessons that I learned to actually expand your partnership. And third, let's leave no one behind. We should not leave anyone behind. We need to make sure that we bring on board the most vulnerable, those who are underserved, those who are left behind. We need to make sure that we address the need of youth or women, elderly, everyone, especially those who have been left behind. But also important, we need to put our resources where our priorities are, and we need to keep funding the, is those emerging and urgent issues, especially in the current context that we are in. We need to continue to build more resilient knowledge cooperation. Resiliency is the key word at this stage. Resilient knowledge cooperation systems for equitable and sustainable development. But most importantly, we need to reimagine and rethink our work to accelerate change. Change is possible, change is doable, change is feasible. It was my pleasure to share these remarks with you. Thanks very much, Giovanni. And this uh, was an extremely rich and inspiring uh, keynote speech that you gave for us here. And certainly um, with your personal stories as driver, driver for your uh, all your work, it 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 I think I share that with many in the audience, gave me goosebumps, and I'm <laughs> very much impressed. Because let's not forget, for you, I think it's 4.30 in the morning, giving such a speech. My goodness, impressed. Um, so um, this, uh, this emphasis uh, that you uh, laid on knowledge sharing, and that is definitely what also people have been doing here in the chat. I hope you've been following. And um, we will uh, build those innovative uh, partnerships that you were talking about with new partners and in that uh, leaving no one behind and accelerating change. Thank you very much, Joanny. And without further ado, I would like to move to our um, next um, point, which is something very new for us. We haven't done that. Uh, before, um, but we have um, the Orange Knowledge Program Impact Award coming up, and we have a little uh, movie for you um, or a, a film to show what this is all about. Yes, and then um, we're, um, we will have a ceremony now with a couple of very exciting pitches also. The, the one that is going to uh, lead you through this session is the chair of the jury, 
Gro Chure, who also is my colleague in the advisory uh, council of OKP. Uh, Gro is uh, the deputy director of the Norwegian uh, Center for International Cooperation Education. Gro, welcome and please take the floor. Thank you very much, Marie. Um, it's my honor to be here with you today and I feel inspired and energized by uh, Joanne's uh, keynote. It was really great to listen to you, Joanne. And I had forgotten that it's only 4.30 in the morning on your side. And as uh, Marie said, I'm even more impressed uh, thinking about that. And as was said, I come from the Norwegian sister organization of NUFIC, actually, and I've been working with NUFIC on many issues over many years, and now I'm really honored to be also a part of the OKP advisory board. Um, and I'm also chairing the jury for this very first Orange Knowledge Impact Award, and it has been quite exciting to be part of that as well. Uh, there were 75 applications for this award, and this was narrowed down to a long list or a long short list of 14 candidates. And I think uh, the jury, uh, the other jury members will agree that we had quite, quite a flexible jury approach. We were quite enthusiastic about all these um, applications, and uh, we deliberated and were able to boil this down to five nominees. And I will reveal these to you very soon. But before I do so, we would, I would also like you to meet the other members of uh, our jury. And the first member needs no further introduction because we have only minutes ago heard her very powerful and inspiring keynote. But uh, Joanne, I would very much like to ask you, you did mention it throughout your speech, but in few words, what does impact mean to you? Thank you, uh, thank you. And again, uh, uh, I want to congratulate the, the jury members for the ex outstanding work they did, and you grow for chairing this work uh, so perfectly. Uh, for me, impact means being able to actually change people's lives beyond numbers in terms of improving the quality of life, in terms of improving all those indicators that we cannot put numbers on. But I also see impact as something bigger and long-term where we can see the outcome of a specific investment that we made today as an institution or a university we can see its long-term impact. We can see its change happen in a couple of years. So long-term, sustainable, and positive outcomes. Thank you. And I think we can see both those uh, approaches in the awards that we are going to hand out later. Uh, but now, uh, next up is representing NUFIC's Orange Knowledge Program's sounding board. Um, that is Geraldine Beaujean. And Geraldine? Uh, do you have some thoughts to share with us on what capacity building means to you? Thank you very much, Guru. Uh, as you only gave me two minutes to <laughs> answer this very difficult question, I decided to write something down and read it here. Um, as as NUFIC's sounding board, we try and help NUFIC to understand the capacity building processes from our experiences in the field. And together, we, we explore with NUFIC how we can uh, stimulate this or what NUFIC should not do to let this happen. So in a way, uh, capacity building to me is a process. It is a process in, for individuals as well as for organizations to develop, improve and sustain skills, knowledge and attitude and other resources like equipment needed to become competent. So capacity building, in a way, is a process to grow, to learn how to do things together, how to do things better, how to change, and how to adapt. Capacity building is a coin with two sides, the individual and the organizational capacity building. For the first one, NUFIC developed the scholarships. For the latter, they also developed the TMTs and the institutional collaboration projects. And both require different skills or competencies to make it to a success. But in the end, capacity building to me is about people. 
about sharing passions, like Giovanni already shared very many of them, about curiosity and about being touched and touching others. And that is exactly what we experienced in the projects of today's nominees. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Geraldine. I think that was very, very well put. <laughs> And the next jury member is actually coming from um, Nufik's alumni network. I am not sure if he is able to join us, but I would anyway like to introduce you to Andrew Mbogori. Um, he's a Kenyan national. Uh, he is currently in Sudan, and he's supposed to be joining us from Gedaref Sudan, where he is right now uh, making an impact, doing work uh, coordinating emergency aid for refugees coming from um, Ethiopia. Um, and he's doing this work on behalf of UNHCR. Um, it doesn't look like we have uh, Andrew with us, but he has been part of our jury meetings and has contributed very uh, constructively in the discussions that we have had there. Um, and what I would have liked to ask him is a little bit about his experience with internationalization um, of education, because he was actually the recipient of a scholarship almost 30 years ago. Um, but I can fully understand he probably both has his hands full with um, the important job he's doing where he is and the connectivity may of course also be a challenge. So um, we are moving on. Uh, lastly, but not least, we are very pleased to have Jeroen Kelderhuis from the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs with us in the jury. Uh, it's been good um, to have the perspective of uh, what uh, capacity building means through the lens of the Dutch policy and to have that perspective with us in the discussions in the jury. And Jeroen, um, what does this award mean to you? Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Chair, and I really liked our deliberations in our jury. And I think uh, not only the people who are have participated in uh, this campaign or in this award uh, are winners, but I think all people participating in this session are truly winners. Um, everyone who invests in her or his capacity is a winner in itself, because by increasing your capacity, you take chance in your own hands. And that's what we also have central in our policy. By doing so, you are touching and inspiring many others and pushing them to do the same. And in that sense, you are accelerating chances uh, and changes, and you create a real impact, not only for yourself, but also for those around you uh, and also in your own community. So we are very much in our policy aiming for this acceleration, uh, not only individuals receiving a scholarship, but these individuals represent the community and by uh, participating in Orange Knowledge Program, they are accelerating their own chances and making real changes for their community. And this is also what is central in actually most of our policy, not only on uh, capacity building, but also in the broad sense. We put uh, people in the center, we put youth more and more in the center uh, because we know they are accelerators for chances and changes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now uh, the time is here. Um, I want to go into a little bit of explanation about the, how we the, about the prize, and then we go into the prize winners. I think the jury we would have liked to uh, award many prizes because there were many many uh, nominees that we really appreciated. And I would echo your own saying that you are all winners because uh, you are doing such great work. But there are three prizes. It's a third prize of a thousand euro, a second prize of uh, 1500 euro, and a first prize of 2500 euro. As I mentioned already, there were 75 applications. Uh, this was narrowed down to a list of 14 candidates. And out of this, uh, I understand that quite a few of the 40 nominees are with us in the audience today. Uh, and uh, again, uh, welcome and congratulations because you are all doing very impressive work. 
uh, we were all very impressed with the, the short videos that we were able to watch and the stories that you have um, described in your applications. But from these 40 nominees, we selected five on our jury shortlist. And I'm going to read these five to you in a random order. So the five nominees are Mamadou Balde, Salome Firi, the Foundation Le Grand Cru, Kelly Topden Dori Tamang, and Diana Manjares Espinosa. These five nominees are all making incredible impact in their communities. And it was difficult for us to select three for this prize. Uh, I would also like to underline that the work of all these five nominees will be highlighted uh, on the website uh, of NUFIC and also in communications following uh, these partner days. But then finally, the three winners that the jury unanimously decided upon uh, are as follows. The third prize goes to a young female alumnus, uh, which the jury believes has a long career ahead of her. The work she does allows a child to be a child, which is uh, of great impact, not only to the individual, but to the society and indeed to the global good. The jury commends the innovative use of media to address sensitive issues such as child marriage and sexual and reproductive health and rights. And also the clear knowledge sharing and scale up plan from this uh, applica applicant. So congratulations on the third prize to Salome Firi from Zambia. This is where we should have, you know, big applause, but I know you're all applauding. The second prize goes to a young and passionate female competitor who managed who managed with, with her team to introduce a national decree to facilitate youth employment, proving that she can indeed change the system. She advocates pragmatic policies and debunks negative stereotypes of not having working experience to empower youth and to provide hope and a future for educated young global citizens by being able to provide practical experience through public service. With the prize, this young woman would like to train rural youth leaders um, where high levels of migration to cities persist due to lack of job opportunities. We, the jury, uh, believe that she particularly deserves the prize to continue the important work she's doing. So congratulations to the second prize, Diana Manjadas Espinosa from Colombia. Congratulations, Diana. And now, the winner uh, of the Orange Knowledge Program Impact Award goes to a foundation that works in close collaboration with partners in Burundi and using art um, to promote sexual and reproductive health and rights and uh, to foster interregional cooperation. They help break taboos by the use of play and theater. And the jury feels that the impact this foundation makes through collaborating is extensive and it shows that art is a great change maker and a driver of impact. Uh, art makes it easier to connect people and it touches lives and communities. And the organization touched the hearts of all the jury members. And uh, I think this makes it a very worthy winner of the first ever impact award. Congratulations to the Dutch Foundation, Le Grand Cru, and especially to the partners from Burundi. And now, I think I am inviting the winner to give a one minute pitch on what they are going to do with the prize uh, money. And, um, I, yes, you have already unmuted, so I then uh, invite you to, I guess I should say, to take the screen. So you're welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we are extremely honored with this award, uh, accepting it as a compliment both to the uh, pioneering work of our organization and of our partners. It's especially uh, um, a nice moment because my partner, uh, Nortje, in Le Grand Cru, the artistic uh, co-director has her birthday today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so. It's the best present we can get. 
Oh, double congratulations. <laughs> okay, uh, for the people who don't know us, we design training directories for dance and theater companies and advocacy groups. We use competences of academic art education instrumental to promote human rights and to stimulate social change through awareness. We encourage people to discover who they are who they are in relation to their environment and how they can progress together. Uh, in a mixed team of university students, but also school leaders, uh, sometimes uh, even handicapped dancers, um, self-reflection uh, self and social an an analysis give rise to refreshing ideas and critical thought. And that's an, an enormous power amongst these youth uh, that resonate to a wider audience by means of performances. And sometimes these performances have four, five, 6,000 people. Mm. Um, we also feel indebted to the legacy of Brazilian pedagogue, Oscar Freire, who actually regarded school systems also as a blueprint of political regimes where social reflection is often bounded within the ideologies of that same regime. Uh, we feel sometimes the people in the street, living in the street really, come up with new ideas, uh, come up with uh, amazing, amazingly refreshing and resilient uh, 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 thoughts. Um, so that's what we would like to add. And the freedom of speech and freedom of, uh, of bodily expression uh, make our talented uh, alumni for us cor very courageous change makers. Mm. Um, for that, we'd like to thank all our partners worldwide and we also like to thank NUFIC because we are uh, maybe a bit an atypical organization for NUFIC uh, being an arts organization uh, for the trust uh, uh, over the years and um, um, giving a professional arts uh, company the possibility to implement uh, life skills and technical skills to give rise uh, to better choices in changing societies. Yes, and, and due to the nature of the work, um, and, and as most of our partners live in Francophone Africa, uh, they do not easily suit in the existing alumni organizations. So therefore we would very much like to invite our partners to discuss their position in society and share best practices. And at the same time, set up a real own uh, alumni artwork, which we would like to be led by our longtime partner uh, and Grand Cru trainer, Rachel Agbosu, who's based in Benin. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. I think we were very impressed by the plans that you had to sort of keep spreading the word. And I think uh, the words of um, Joanne in her uh, speech is something that we will all take with us, that knowledge is power and knowledge shared is uh, power multiplied. And I think that also can, um, can apply to the work that you are doing. So I think... Um, the time is up to, to wrap up this ceremony because I know there is more program uh, on the agenda. Uh, on behalf of myself, I would like to thank Nafik very much for letting me be a part of this. It has been inspiring and, um, and uh, really, really uh, uplifting to, to join in such an international forum and hear all these wonderful full stories. Um, I would also like to thank my fellow judges very much for the work. I think it has been great to see that we can come together across the continent on the digital platform without any pre previous knowledge. Um, I don't know who this is, but we will wait and see. <laughs> In any case, I would just like to thank all the nominees and congratulations again to the three winners. And uh, I would like to repeat what I said earlier, that this is not the last that we have seen of the winners or the, the five uh, nominees. Uh, they will be highlighted and featured in Orange uh, Knowledge Program communications uh, in the weeks to follow. So on that, I just say thank you very much and uh, have a really good day onward. Marie, over to you. Thanks so much, Gro, and uh, congratulations to all the nominees and winners. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, thing that we can now continue. And in the next session, uh, the, 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 the final one, 
uh, we're going to be looking forward. So uh, for that, um, you know, I want to, I would like to uh, see actually um, what we together see on the horizon. What is, a, um, what is the kind of um, uh, topics, themes, uh, priorities uh, that, that we should uh, together be focusing on? So uh, we have some poll results from the earlier sessions uh, that could inspire us to think about those uh, future opportunities. And you remember well, that the impact of education on youth, a, a, a subject which is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about, <laughs> uh, is something that you all find very important. And also uh, digitalization, but also the other topics like uh, you just, the winner just talked about uh, as well. So um, that one we keep very much in mind because what, uh, we uh, want to do here is to get more work done and to get more uh, knowledge uh, to be shared and more themes to be explored together. Now, this is why uh, we're all here together and we want to be following that up directly with you and that's why uh, we have the Orange Innovation events that are going to start from January 2021 on. So um, we would like to uh, show you um, a, a short uh, film uh, to, to show you what this is all about, the Orange Innovation events. <laughs> And uh, I don't know how it was with you, but sometimes this movie was accelerating a bit. And I think that's also how it's going to look like in practice, our uh, innovation, orange innovation events. Now, um, what I would like to do with you is the following. Of course, with all these uh, uh, new inputs you got afterwards of uh, Dr. Joanny and uh, also this award ceremony, there might have been other um, uh, things that you want to, to give us uh, in, this, um, uh, in, in this community that you still want to share as a word of advice. If you could give us one word of advice, is, there, um, is that something uh, you can share? And again here, if you go to, um, if you uh, browse on your uh, screen, you see the view options and there you click again on annotate. And there um, you're going to find an option also to type in something. Could you uh, type in that one word of advice that you would like to give to us and uh, share? So let me see how that is working out. Partnerships, yeah, that is something which especially also Dr. Joanny uh, gave a new dimension and a new meaning. I think cre creativity is something which is also referring to these new 21st century skills, but what makes us, um, you know, uh, distinguishes us. Um, and flexibility, that is also a skill we all uh, very much need also in building partnerships and sustaining them. Digitalization, that's what we're here for. And uh, we'll do that in a blended way, also with those that cannot maybe real time join us, but still stay in touch. More empathy, that's something which is uh, very important, especially when working in partnerships and when you're working in difficult uh, context and 
I like the one about having fun while learning. This is something which, you know, I sometimes try to tell my children. <laughs> it takes creativity also from our side, from teachers. And the co-ownership principle is also an important one uh, for uh, a sustainable partnership that's, that bring results that last. And uh, the empowering of the global south and the principles of equality uh, that were uh, brought forward um, as well in the keynotes, that is something um, uh, very much uh, close to uh, our heart as well. So um, these are the kind of things that are very um, inspiring for us um, and maybe uh, here, uh, uh, I can also share with you that uh, this uh, uh, enjoying the process is not only from your side, but also from here. Uh, it's uh, wonderful and fulfilling to, uh, to share knowledge, to exchange in all kinds of ways. And uh, that's why, uh, like I said, um, communication is something we continue. Uh, there will be in uh, the community that uh, we are expanding right now, um, the newsletter, a special edition where we're coming back uh, to these uh, Orange Innovation events and uh, see how we can uh, take this forward and involve you in uh, co-creating that. Now about uh, co-creating, that is an important one. Here, um, uh, I have to be um, quite grateful to uh, all those uh, partners that are actually have been co-creating this whole process uh, for the Orange Knowledge uh, Program uh, weeks that we uh, are now, uh, you know, it's culminating in this event. And this co-creation has not only been uh, with our partners in the Orange Knowledge Program, but also very much, you know, uh, the, the partner days, very much also um, thanks to the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And of course, um, Pascal Grotenhuis did the keynote and Jeroen Kelderhuis also um, added um, to, um, uh, to the wisdom of the jury in um, bringing such a wonderful winner forward. And um, I think what we're seeing right now on the screen is also very much a co-creation of uh, what kind of things we find important. And let's remember last year, we had a, a partner day uh, with a, you know, much, much fewer participants. And here we uh, have so many participants from all over the world and this feels very special. So on behalf of the organizing team, I would really like to thank you um, for uh, attending this uh, partner days and uh, uh, also for your engagement in, uh, in the chat. And I wish we could continue um, uh, with also uh, chatting in that sense. Let's do so in uh, the Orange Innovation event. So on behalf of the organizers uh, at NAFIC and also at the partners, I would like to thank you very much uh, for this, uh, for attending and engaging in this conference of the Partner Days. Thank you very much and hope to see you soon in person. Thank you.